is to be able to contain the dimensions that God wants to commit into your hands. Can we ask him for largeness? Meanwhile, it might interest you to know that those of us that from, are from the middle belt of Nigeria are considered to be persons with narrow hearts. Very narrow. Very narrow. And that is because our circumstances, our situations seems to have so much ability to shape us. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why we need to pray and ask for enlargement. Someone that has never seen any form of uh, possibility all through his life, when you begin to tell him about great things, he doesn't even have the compartment to contain it. He begins to feel that, okay, this kind of stuff can happen to others, but it cannot happen to me. So can we can we labor? Can we labor? Can we labor and ask him? I'm in need of enlargement. I'm in need of enlargement. I'm in need of enlargement. Something needs to happen to me that will enlarge me. That will enlarge me. We cry unto God. We cry unto God. We are in need. We are in need of enlargement. Take us beyond the shape that our circumstances placed upon us. Take us beyond the shape that our situation placed upon us. Give us the capacity in form of enlargement to be able to contain the vision of God so that we can contain it. We must receive grace to contain it. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. In Jesus' mighty name we do pray. And so, Lord, tonight as we proceed, we ask that you run along and open the heart of everyone under the sound of my voice to come into the understanding of the things that you so desperately desire that we should apprehend and cause your grace to flow and let it be written upon our hearts like tablets. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' mighty name. You may be seated. So yesterday we began to talk about the uh, numerous states of the human mind that is possible. We saw the first example, which is the anxious mind. And we also received the commandment of God that is in the book of Philippians chapter 6 from the NIV version. Be anxious for nothing. It's a commandment. Be anxious for nothing. For nothing, but in all things, by prayer and supplication, coupled with thanksgiving. So the same things that build anxiety in the heart of man are the same things that should be motivations that will lead us to the place of prayer. So we have seen the anxious mind. And when I came into the hall tonight, I met Pastor Tony. Praying, leading prayers, and he took one of the scriptures from my text, from my jota, and that's Romans chapter 1. I'd like you to turn Romans chapter 1, Romans chapter 1, verse number 28, Romans chapter 1, verse number 28, and even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. That's the second state of a mind. 
This second state of the mind finds expression any time we begin to rebel against God. What God does is that he now allows us to go on our own tangent. That's what makes our minds reprobate. If someone is going to recover from a reprobate mind, meanwhile, it will interest you to know uh, that the word reprobate is the same word, worthless. But we will like to engage this scripture from another translation of the Bible so that we can see the words that are used uh, therein. This is New King James. It's, too, it's still related to, okay, this NIV. Furthermore, since they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, he gave them over to a depraved mind. Depraved mind. Depraved mind. All right, another translation of the scripture. Still depraved. Can you go to um, another translation? The Message Bible. Since they did not bother to acknowledge God, God quit bothering them and let them run loose. So, have you ever seen? Oh, are you there? All right. Let them run loose. When you see someone whose mind is running loose, he has refused to retain God in his memory. God can no longer restrain him. God can no longer uh, 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 resist him. He has decided to discard every form of influence, every form of government of God from around his life. The resultant effect of that is that God releases them to function by a mind that is reprobate. All right, like I said, another meaning for reprobate is what is worthless. Worthless. Now, when you find someone in this condition, uh, the first thing that you need to do in order to begin the process of restoration is to get them to repent because they discarded the knowledge of God. They decided not to be under any situation where God can restrain them. That was why God gave them up. You see, if you still regard the knowledge of God, the fear of God, uh, you, this cannot be your condition. But the moment you decide that you don't want any form of strings to be attached to you, to regulate you from the realm of God, what he does is that he gives you up to a reprobate mind. I walked on the streets of Sao Paulo in Brazil, and I saw one dude. The guy was just by the corner of the street, and I was wondering, hey, what brought this guy here? Ah, the pastor said, ah. Oh. The pastor that invited me, my brother in, in Brazil, my elder brother, Pastor Maxwell, uh, I don't think he has been with us. Maxwell. Well, he will be with us, just in case he has not. Uh, we were, he said, that man, if you take him to a psychiatrist in Brazil, they will not attend to such people. Because the psychiatrist says they are in the bottomless pit. This a psychiatrist is trained to deal with such people. But there is, there is a certain hard drug in Brazil. It's not in Nigeria. Thank God for that. Hallelujah. That if, the moment you take that hard drug, I've forgotten the name. If, if evangelists were here, it would have helped me. When you take that drug, the next thing that you, you fall in love with is very terrible smell. You like places like the toilet. You like places like the pit latrine. You like, oh, when the odor is strange, you just go there and that's where you tabernacle. <laughs> so, so in Brazil, you will see a lot of them on the streets. They don't know that it's daybreak. They, don't, they are not aware of that. On the streets, by trash cans, by anywhere there is a strange odor, the guy embraces, in fact, he colonizes that place as his own very location. His mind has become worthless. The Lord will help us in the name of Jesus. The, the, the joy about this state of worthlessness is that if a man still retains God in his memory, he can never get to this 
point. So I'm not talking to people with reprobate minds right now. And that's, that's a great job. Because if you see those guys, even psychiatrists don't admit them. They said there, he spoke one, one uh, Portuguese. Huh? And the interpretation is that he, his, his location is at the center of the bottomless pit. That's the only way to interpret that. Hallelujah. The mind is worthless. So we in this hall, we listening to me online, uh, have not arrived here and will not arrive here. But I just need to show you that there is such a reality. Okay? Okay, can we move to the book of Romans chapter 8, verse number 6. While Pastor Philip, uh, you mobilize your team to make my voice note available because we are going to run an analysis of that uh, voice note. Romans chapter 8, verse number 6. Are you there? For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Now, I would like to explain something here. The word used death in this scripture is the same word that is used for paralysis. Paralysis. All right? If someone is paralyzed in his limbs, it means he, can't, he doesn't have feeling. So you tap the person on the thigh, the person cannot feel it because the thigh is dead to feeling. Do you, do you understand that? All right. So in understanding uh, the way the body of Christ works, um, we need to understand how the central nervous system works. All right. The central nervous system consists of the brain and the spinal cord. The brain is like the computer. The brain is like the processing terminal. And when uh, things are processed in the brain, the, the result of what is being processed is communicated through the lifeline called the spinal cord to the actual area of the body where an action needs to take place. So, you see, the brain is the processing center and the spinal cord is the linkage to every part of the body. And that's what forms the central nervous system. In order for you to understand the workings of the body of Christ, you must be acquainted with the dynamics of the central nervous system. Because in the body of Christ, uh, the mystical body of Christ, Christ himself, his office and his person happens to constitute the head. That's the brain box. That's where commands come from. That's where the instructions come from. That's where your calling comes from. That's where your anointing comes from. That's where the grace that you function in comes from. And this, the central nervous system consists, like I said, the brain and the spinal cord. And in the mystical body of Christ, that's the place of the head of the church, even Christ Jesus and the Holy Spirit operates like the spinal cord. He's the one that links uh, the directives that comes from Christ to every individual believer for response. So the point is this, if Jesus is making a transmission through the Holy Ghost and you cannot sense what the Holy Ghost is transmitting into your heart, it means you are in a state of disconnection from the protocol of life that is in the mystical body of Christ. So that state of not being able to coordinate with the head is a state of paralysis and that's the word that was used for death here. Exactly? Are you with me? All right. So, when the Bible says to be carnally minded, uh, to be carnally minded doesn't necessarily mean to be demonic. But it's just that you are, the mind is aligned to everything that is carnal. So, what drives your, your, your perspective is um, either personal success, uh, your beauty, your courage, your decorum, your demeanor. You know, you just, um, there is a concept, an idea of yourself that you want to sell and you will do anything whatsoever to ensure that that idea is sold to the public. And now, all, all of that is carnal. And it must be understood that, um, hallelujah, it must be understood that if the devil is going to tickle your fancy, he's going to sell carnality. He's going to sell carnality to you. Uh, so if you discover 
that what is being preached in a certain place is about how you can get new cars, new jobs, new elevations, much more money. Uh, the scope of that delivery is on the canal plane. Uh, all the things that I just spoke about, Satan and demons can give them to you. If, if Satan considers you an obstruction to his agenda, he can make provision to give you a promotion. If the promotion will be such a distraction to you as to allow you give him access to uh, 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 the pathway that is needed for him to fulfill his agenda. You are still in the canal plane. Now, what happens is this. According to scripture, it is possible for what preoccupies our mind to be carnal thing. So that's what the Bible calls the carnal mind. We went for those days when I was still in the service, we went for a training in, in Calabar. And when we went for break, a heated discussion began. The reason for the discussion was that um, a certain bank was offering our staff 20 million naira loan. And uh, it, it looked like a very important subject. So a lot of people were discussing what they would do with the loan. Um, one of the guys said he was going, uh, the moment we were done with the training, he was going to Finland. Finland. Uh, what year was this? Uh, it was like 2015 that he was leaving the training and moving to Finland. Uh, those of you that know Finland, one of the major commodities you can find in Finland is what we call stockfish. You, see, you, you know what stockfish is? Okay, stockfish. That he's going to buy a truckload, a, um, a container load of, of stockfish. In fact, the time he, his product will be hitting the ports, People would have given him money to purchase it already. Hallelujah. That, that's the reason why he needs the loan. Are you there? Okay. Another one said he, he, he was born poor. So right now that this loan is coming, he's going to buy a certain vehicle. That Those days, we used to call that vehicle demon. That he was going to get one of those demons so that he can do damage to poverty forever. I was listening to all the options, what the 20 million will create, what it will do. And then they now asked me, Pastor, what are you up to? What are you going to do with 20 million? I said, well, I'm not going to receive the loan. Hey. I, I, broke, I broke their spirit. I broke their... In fact, the discussion ended. Everybody went, went on break. Now, that is... Are you with me? Two years later. After everybody had accessed the loans, and are, are you there? We now came for training again. Two years later. Hey! And when we, it's only when we come for trainings that you can see people on the field because we are scattered. Some are in Meduguri, some are in Kaduna, some are in uh, um, so many places. So you'll never see them again because we're on the field. Only the trainings bring you people together. So we now had a training two years after that time where the loan had, is two years old now. The man that said he wanted to go to Finland to bring stockfish, he has not traveled. And meanwhile, the loan has finished. Okay? The guy that said, it was only the guy that said he wanted to purchase one of those demons. He, he bought his demons. But he, he, the, the, the issue is payment. The payment plan. <laughs> so when we got back for the training two years later, everybody was depressed. And everybody began to say, ah, if we had known, would have listened to pastor. Because pastor is free now. Do you know that that loan lingered for five, six years? The stockfish never came from Finland. When I went to ask the Lord, Lord, there is loan. How we, what are we going to do with this loan? The great one said, you don't need loan. That was why my disposition about the loan was... No, no. All of my colleagues in that training that time were victims of that loan and for five years running, they could not pay back. 
If there's anybody in this room that you believe that something needs to happen in order for the sense of your being to mature, maybe you need to get a car before you can enter into the full scope of the sense of your being. Let me give you an idea. I had the funds to buy a car every time my salary was paid. And for seven years, God will not allow me to buy a car. So I know how to go around in Lagos with the yellow buses. And I enjoyed my time moving. The buses have a sound. There's a background sound. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Yeah, so if you are allergic to sound, don't go by the yellow buses. But it's under that background sound ooh, that I got revelations that I taught you in this. When that sound becomes high, that's when it's very easy for me to hear the Holy Ghost. The Bible says to be carnally minded is paralysis. It brings you into a state where it is difficult for you to perceive what the Holy Ghost is driving at. What Jesus through the Holy Ghost is driving at. You see, carnality is possessive in nature. It can trap you to itself such that you no longer care what God is saying. And your mind is the instrument that is enslaved in the circumference of carnality. I'm going to stop here so that we can listen to a tape. The reason for which I brought this voice note is so that we can do an analysis. The way you respond will suggest if you've been following my lecture. Meanwhile, the background to the tape is that uh, a minister for, uh, of the gospel from South Africa reached out to me and when we, we started first chatting on Facebook Messenger, he reached out to us and I was the one that responded to him and I saw he had a genuine need. So we shared numbers and hopped on Facebook and from Facebook we could call each other and through phone calls uh, the Lord began to uh, you know, accomplish some good work in the life of this pastor. It was subsequently when I got a visa to South Africa that I met him face to face. But we've been having a relationship that is ministry-based for about two years before we eventually met. This was the condition he was in as at the time I met him. Okay? Give me the tape. Please listen. Good evening, Apostles. I hope you are well. Um, yes, sir. So, well, the beginning of 2020, I encountered an experience I didn't know how to deal with. As a minister of God, I had this young prophet who had his own ministry who came to me for mentorship in uh, November um, 2019. Then in June 2020, I got to discover that this prophet was having some serious issues and attacks in his life, spiritual attacks in his life. All right, so a younger minister approached this person that I'm talking to, and uh, this, that younger minister, unknown to this preacher, was part of a cult. All right? Um, when we say a cult, we mean that there is a deity in the center of the fellowship that you are introduced to, and then you use the influence of that deity on the platform as masquerading as if you are doing ministry. And there's a lot of that right now that is going on in Africa. There's a lot of that right now that is going on in Europe. There's a lot of that right now that is going on in different parts of the world. So he got involved with this young guy and um, he began to exercise oversight over the young minister and then eventually he found out that the young minister was in a serious situation and the situation was that he was part of a cult and at, at the time he met with the young man, the young man was trying to dissociate himself from the occult group. Are you with me? Unfortunately, unfortunately, very, very unfortunately, the grandmaster of the occult group happened to be in Nigeria. Unfortunately, I don't know why. The name of Nigeria appears in dark quarters. That will not be the case forever. 
in the name of Jesus. I'm not talking about a Nigerian in Port Harcourt, a Nigerian in South Africa. So the guy exported the ways of the deity. In what traveling bag did he carry the spirit from the airport, Muritala Mohammed Airport, Lagos, to South Africa and established that order of priesthood there and was getting patronage from pastors? So the young man was trying to dissociate from that occult group, all right? Please, listen carefully. Yeah? Go on. Ministry and everything that he was involved in to because he was trying to leave an occultic group or network he was initiated into. He joined an, you know, a, an occultic group and got initiated into this satanic uh, network while he was a minister of God. And ever since... He then, you know, was tormented by demonic spirits and went everywhere looking for help, but no minister could deliver him. Then in, in July uh, 2020, he confessed to me and told me the whole story of how he, you know, what he did and how he was uh, initiated into the satanic uh, uh, group because he wanted church growth. After I heard everything, I really did not know how to reconcile such a brother back to the Lord as the case was new to me. But then I, I asked him to pray and confess uh, Psalm 25 and told him I will pray for him. Apostle, the very same day I knelt to pray for this particular gentleman, I saw the face of the Nigerian pastor who initiated him into this occultic spirit, looking at me. I could see it with my eyes closed. The face of this gentleman, I opened my eyes and the image disappeared immediately. After this incident, I started having an awkward experience. At first, it started as a thought pattern that came on my mind that was insulting the Lord, insulting God, insulting the Spirit of God, you know. I rebuked the thought in shock because I didn't know what was going on. It was the first time even to experience. The first symptom that he began to experience the moment he knelt down to begin to pray for the young man was that he saw in his subconscious the image of the Nigerian pastor that was a grandmaster of the occult group. The next symptom he began to see was that the spirit of blasphemy was thinking through his thoughts. Are you there? Is there anybody in this auditorium or anybody online that sometimes you feel an imposing thought? You know this is not your thought, but it's imposing. It's imposing. Anyone ever have that, had that experience before? Imposing thought. Now let me tell you what is happening it is because of a priesthood. It means there is a priest that considers you deadly and that priest has found a way of releasing demons into your space. So those thoughts that you were thinking were not independent. They were thoughts that were facilitated and imposed upon your mind by demons. Are you there? By demons. And that is the reason for which we want to talk a little bit about uh, a, a deeper, much deeper about the subject in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 10. The one evidence that shows that you are under spiritual assault are those imposing thoughts, imposing. In this case, the thoughts are in the shape of blasphemy. So the spirits that were responsible were the spirits of blasphemy. Uh, once upon a time, when I was a younger minister, we had not yet built this auditorium. We were in the other prayer tent uh, in Wurukum. Then this lady shows up in, in, uh, for counseling, and she bullied all the protocol and bullied her way into my office. And I asked her to sit down, and then she said she's in trouble. She doesn't understand herself, and... She began to tell me, if the thoughts come, she will tell me what she's thinking, and then they are all blasphemies. So I now realized from my little uh, Bible study that it was the spirit of blasphemy that was imposing 
itself upon her thought life. And anytime that happens, anytime that takes place, it is because a priesthood has been set up and demons have been deployed to superimpose that consciousness on the thoughts of an individual. So I had to walk her through the process of pulling down stronghold. Somebody said pulling down stronghold. So the first symptom that this pastor, and this is a genuine pastor, that is sending me this voice note. All right? And I informed him that I'll be using his voice note for an analysis session. And that's the, the reason why I will not mention his name. Because one of these days he's going to be here. Uh, if you are very sharp and you can retain the sound of his voice, you will hear it again. But, you know, today we need to analyze his condition. Are you still there? Please, media people, always follow this my hand. When you see the hand, it's not so difficult to stop a media de- uh, um, stream. It's just to touch, pause. Don't need to pray about it, just pause. Okay? So when, when I do this way, what do you do? All right, so go on. To experience such, such a spiritual, spiritual attack. attack. <clears throat> but when I rebuked the, you know, the, the thought, it persisted you know, uh, for three days, full days, and then disappeared. Second thing I'd like to bring to your knowledge is one of the ways that you will know that you are under a spell, and what I mean by a spell, a spell is a chain that is not visible. A spell is a fetter that is not visible. A spell are cuffs, handcuffs that are not visible. The evidence that someone is laboring under a spell is that the spell tries to be defiant to resistance. So you see, when you notice that you resisted it, you rebuked it, and it refused to go initially, it is an indication of the fact that it is a spell. Are you there? Now I'm going to show you how to deal with such spells. There are three levels of dealing with it, depending on the intensity. And obviously, I know you know the third level. The third level is to deal with the priest that is even responsible for the altar in the first place. Are you there? But you don't need to deal with the priest as your first resort. Because we want the priest to survive, to live and find Jesus. That's our ultimate goal. All right? But in, when the defiance continues, um, you may have no choice but to Strike at that level. Okay? But we're going to show you the progression. What you need to do, what you need to continue to do until you find total liberty. The proof that you are in liberty is in a few scriptures. Are you there? I say, are you there? All right. So let me show you the configuration of uh, the accurate mind. If your mind is not in, in the description that I'll be making from three scriptures right now, if that's not the state of your mind, then you need to see one of the pastors in the pastor section after this time out. All right, 2 Timothy chapter 1 verse 8. These scriptures that I'm revealing are scriptures that reveal the accurate state of the mind that the Holy Spirit can easily walk upon and light upon to invite you to think the thoughts of God. Are you there? So in the book of 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7. Let's go to 7. We'll just do 7. For God had not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of what? A sound mind. So the proof that you, your mind is in the best state of affairs, such that if the Holy Spirit wants to invite you to reason with him, you are so ready for such an encounter, is that your mind is sound. Now, stay with me. 
sometimes these English language words might be um, difficult to explain. Sound mind. Somebody might ask, okay, what is sound mind? According to the Greek word here, sound mind means a mind under your control. A mind that is under what? Your control. If the mind is not sound, the mind will begin to exercise itself at, as though it, it is controlling you. Whenever you see symptoms of the fact that your thoughts are so, are so powerful that they seek to dominate you, they seek to control you, it is indicative of the fact that you are under satanic torment. Because the description of a sound mind is a mind that is under your control. Now, if I want to move into the prophetic to know the mind of God, I can do that. I know what to do. You know what I'll do? I'll get the guy on the keyboard. When he begins to play, then I'll begin to pray in the spirit and I'll set my mind on things above. The moment I set my mind there, I forget about everything. The only thing that concerns me is what Jesus is saying, is what is moving in the Holy Ghost. The moment I set myself like that, something will drop. And we can even do it now. And you will see, I will begin to know things about people in this place. Begin to receive insight. You see, you can go on that adventure, that kind of journey of inquiry if you are launching from the path of a sound mind. Whenever you notice that your mind is domineering, your mind is compelling, and your mind seeks to subdue you, you are up against a devil, up against persons without bodies. Is that clear? Good. Good. If it proves to be defiant, it, is mean, it means it's under an influence. So the first description of an accurate mind is that it is sound, and sound in this context means under your control. Exactly? Under your control. As we go on, because I'm going to give you a brief lecture on how to deal with strongholds and also how to deal with demons that want to manipulate your thoughts um, deliberately, uh, uh, there are they are, they are some training that we are going to do instantly in this place tonight. And you are going to practice it, okay? All right, second description of... Uh, an accurate mind is in the book of Mark chapter 5 verse 15. And they came, they come to Jesus and see him that was possessed with the devil sitting uh, and, and had the legion sitting and clothed and in his right mind. Now, I need to explain uh, the word right right here. The word right here in the Greek is sophroneo. Sophroneo. Sophroneo means uh, there's only one way I can explain this based on the words I have on my lexicon. My lexicon is quite detailed and deep. But this is the description that I get from the lexicon. Uh, uh, right mind, it means a mind that is not intoxicated. You know, stay with me. It's not what? Intoxicated. It is sober. Now, have you ever seen someone that is drunk? Ever seen a drunk man? He sings spontaneously. The songs are strange. They don't follow music patterns. It, the songs just flow. It's, it's a product of intoxication. But when we say someone is sober... It means he has come out of the influence of intoxication. So the scripture here is suggesting a sober mind. And the way we can understand a sober mind is that it is not under the influence of intoxication. It means when the demons were operating on him, it was as though he was perpetually intoxicated. And the way he was operated was not, operating was not coordinated. But for the first time in a long time, they find the man sober. He was outside of the influence of 
intoxication. Sober, not intoxicated. Okay? And finally, in the book of Romans chapter 8 verse 6, we see the last sign of an accurate mind. The Bible says, for to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Now, give me that from NIV. Maybe it will break it down. For to be carnally minded is death, but the mind controlled by the spirit is life. So the idea of a mind, all right, an accurate mind is a mind under the influence of the Holy Spirit. Is that clear? Meanwhile, when we study further on the mind, you will see that you are supposed to be in control of your mind because the Bible says, set your mind, set your affections, set them on the things that are above. He said, if whatsoever is pure, whatsoever has virtue, he said, think on those things. It means you are supposed to always have control of your mind. You can decide what you think. But when there is bondage in your mind, the spirit imposes upon you what you should think. That's the, a situation of intoxication. You are not sober. There is an influence that has hijacked the mind. And that's a bad place to be. So the description that this pastor gives us about his experience is suggestive of the fact that demons began to invade the mind. And that's why we are studying the first battlefield is the mind. There are other battlefields. The battlefield of finances exists. The battlefield of bodily health. Are you there? So, but we are still on the first lane of the battlefield. I'll need to show you battlefields before we now begin to talk about the weapons of our warfare and rules of engagement. If you have a witch in your compound that is tormenting everybody in the dream... How do you check the person out? How do you checkmate their activities? So there are rules of engagement. What you need to do, that the witch will pack, pack from the compound and greet everybody. Senu, 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 and pack away. They are th- if you know rules of engagement, and the thing about the agents of the kingdom of darkness is that when they find that there is someone that is knowledgeable in the realm, they don't like to fight. They pack. Even Satan himself knows that he's short of uh, resources. So when he comes and he sees that there is no possible way for victory, many times in scripture you will see he departs for a season. Are you there? All right. So, hallelujah. You still have the voice note has not finished? Okay. You can switch it on and kept rebuking it. After three weeks, the thought came back so strong. I then realized that it was not a thought as I thought, but a voice that I kept hearing in my After mind. Three you know, weeks, it was as though my mind was so strong. Uh, so what is going on there is priesthood. Someone has summoned some devils, and then he had spoken, so the devils are relaying the things the person has said into your head. Sometimes, are you there? Now, I heard of a witch that was in town here, and the son was somewhere abroad schooling, and she told everybody that she's going to call uh, her son back. She misses her son. And one week later, the guy with his bag was back home. And he told him, I'm the one that called you back. It's not as if she appeared and disappeared there, or disappeared and appeared there. She used demons to speak into his head. And to him, it was an instruction because it was overwhelming. His mind was intoxicated until he found himself in Makodi. The voices never stopped. So he said he realized that it was not just a thought, but it was a voice that was speaking into his head. It's a product of enchantment. I watched uh, a movie yesterday from Mount Zion 
uh, movie productions. How I wish I could cut that section and have it played on the screen. You will see the kind of ritual that is done in order to send demons to speak into somebody's head. So what he was, what he was experiencing was the effect of a priesthood. And just in case you are listening online and voices have been speaking into your head, uh, I think we have the solution to your challenge right here. Hallelujah. All right. In seeking to decipher the solution, I would like us to turn again to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 10. You know, we have said that throughout this year, the subject is spiritual warfare. Anytime I'm, I mount the podium, maybe for an evening service, we'll be talking spiritual warfare. Anytime I, I, I come for a conference, uh, uh, even if the conference is not related to spiritual warfare, I will use one session and teach you spiritual warfare. The objective, meanwhile, that directive came from the Lord Jesus uh, that we, we need to be equipped to be able to engage the enemy because of the flood of darkness that is going to be coming in globally. Uh, so the average believer is supposed to be trained. In keeping with this, we have decided to take the bull by the horn. First Corinthians chapter 10, we'll look at our text again. And if we can do this, we will now take questions from uh, the online community. Second Corinthians chapter 10, beginning from verse number 4. Now, I'd like us to take that, the scripture again with details. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. So the first thing we need to deal with are what? Strongholds. Go on. Casting down of imaginations. Second thing we need to deal with are what? Imaginations. So we pull down strongholds. We cast down imaginations. And also we cast down high things that exalt themselves against the knowledge of God, okay? And we bring into captivity every thought. Now, I did a study to know what um, prompted Paul to use this kind of description uh, in explaining uh, the warfare of the mind. And in the research that I did, I found out that this scripture that Paul uh, 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 presents to us in, in this chapter and verse is descriptive of a fortress. Is descriptive of a fortress. And uh, it says, can we go back to four? Pulling down the strongholds are equivalent to walls in a fortress. Strongholds are equivalent to what? Walls. Uh, high things and imaginations are equivalent to towers in a fortress. And then thoughts are equivalent to prison houses that are inside of the fortress. So we have three things to deal with. The first thing are the walls... Then the second thing are the towers. And then the third thing are the prison houses. Somebody say walls. That's what makes it a stronghold. They are barricades. They are very mighty walls that are built so that it is impregnable. That's what makes it what? A stronghold. Do you still remember the walls of Jericho? The walls of Jericho, for instance, were a cuboid. The length of the wall was equivalent to the breadth of the wall. And if you are a good Bible student, you will remember that Rahab's house had its foundation on the wall. And the historical perspective that I've read suggests that seven war horses can run side by side 
on the walls of Jericho, making it a stronghold, a fortress, a fortress that was not that was engineered never to be breached. So when Satan puts his structures in the mind of a man, he builds the structures in such a way that it will be impossible to breach it except by the hand of God. Are you with me? Now, so listen. Listen. So when demons begin to operate around your mind and to give you ideas, if you begin to entertain the ideas, the demons will begin to feast on your thoughts. And what will happen is that they will begin to build strongholds in your mind. If you come under an anointed arena and the demons are casted out, yes, they will flee instantly. But even though the demons are no longer there, because they built a mental stronghold in your mind, their influence will still be on your life because a fortress with walls have already been built. How many of you have seen a fence being built? It doesn't just appear. It is built brick after brick. It is built block after block. That's how Satan builds a stronghold. Are you, are you with me? And that is the reason for which expelling devils is instant, but casting down a stronghold will take a process of time because you are going to dismantle that wall brick after brick the same way it was constructed. You are not with me? Are you with me? Okay. The brother there says he's not with me. You are not with me? You are not understanding what I'm saying? Because you, you shook your head like this. Does that mean it's a deep revelation or you are not understanding? What's the meaning of that? Huh? He, okay, he's with me. So he, he, was, he, he marveled that day at the revelation. Hallelujah. Now, <laughs> Amen. Hallelujah. Are you there? Now, so this is what the devil does. He knows that you might arrest him and you might cast him out. But even though you have casted him out and he has succeeded in building a stronghold, his influence will still be retained in his absence. So we are up against a situation where we must learn how to destroy walls that are built. Is that clear? So we have three things to destroy here. First are walls, those are the strongholds. Second thing, second thing we need to destroy are high things, those are towers. And you know what the high things are? They are exaggerations. High things are what? The hype. The hype about COVID was more than COVID. The whole COVID era was an exaggeration. And I got reliable information from high people in the medical uh, war front uh, during the COVID time that anybody that dies in the hospital that should say he was a COVID death. Make the numbers. Make it count. So that we can create a false sense of doom and any law or any strategy, any initiative that is taken under that situation will be considered tender mercies. So people that died of heart attack, their names were slotted into the COVID list. In fact, a, a, a somebody died in the hospital, the hospital here. People could not bury him because they lied that it was COVID. It was much later that they said, okay, it, it, the truth is that it's not COVID. Ah, towers are exaggerations. Are you there? So we need to take down the walls. Then we need to take down the towers. They are exalted. They are exaggerated. We need to reduce them to their true height. Satan intends to magnify many things. And it keeps you perpetually in bondage. As long as you accept to keep magnifying the things that are microscopic. Because it gives you a lens. A lens that multiplies the size a thousand times. And he makes spectacles out of those lenses. And you'll be viewing nothingness and thinking it is an edifice because he has built a tower in your mind. And finally, he begins to run thoughts through your mind that even though the padlock on the 
prison house has been broken, you yourself will not want to violate the security system. You will be sitting down inside. The padlock is broken, but you can come out, not because there was no physical liberty, because you are still bound in your mind. Are you there? Turn your Bible with me to the book of Numbers chapter 13. And I'm going to show you a people that God stretched forth his hand to bring out of the land of Egypt. They had already reached the border of the land that God had promised them. And here they were. They sent spies into the land to bring a feedback about the state of the land. Then the bondage that was in their mind began to speak. So the prison houses can be opened. The towers can be demolished. Are you there? But the bondage in the mind can keep a man in captivity. Numbers 13, verse 25. Come with me quickly. And they returned from searching of the land after 40 days. And they went and came to Moses and to Aaron and to all the congregation of the children of Israel unto the wilderness of Paran to Kadesh and brought back word unto them and unto all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land and they told him and said we came into the land where thou sentest us and surely it floweth with milk and honey and this is the fruit of it Nevertheless, the people be strong. Now, this, this one is of the mind. The people be strong that dwell in the land, and the cities are walled. Can you underline walled? What's the name of that? Oh, my God. This lecture. Okay, because you are not with me. I, the, the syllabus has been abridged. Um, oh, my God. Now, you see, after this lecture, I was supposed to label the actual strongholds and give them names. But that labeling I will no longer do because while I was teaching, you, some of you were in France thinking of, ah, may the Lord bring you back from where you have gone. Oh, I'm just being reminded that you are not the only congregation that we have. Uh, the people online, uh, how are you? Okay. All right. Now, so let, let's go there. He said, nevertheless, the people be strong that dwell in the land, and the cities are, what? War. And what's the name of that? It's the stronghold. And very great. And so the next description of the city is that they are walled, and the other description is that they are what? Very great. And moreover, we saw the children of Anak there, and the Amalekites dwell in the land of the south. And the Hittites and the Jebusites and the Amorites dwell in the mountains. And the Canaanites dwell by the sea and by the coast of Jordan. And Caleb stilled the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and possess it, for we are well able to overcome it. This guy had a sound mind. A man with a sound mind is capable of believing the words of God. A man with a sound mind is able to distinguish between truth and true. I'm going to teach you on that. Truth and what? True. Truth is the word of God. True might be reality. True might be the, current, the description of the current circumstance. But a man that God is going to use does not walk with true. He walks with truth. He despises true. And his worldview is built on the pedestal of truth. And Caleb sealed the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and possess it. For we are well able to overcome it. But the men that went up with him said we be not able to go against the people for they are stronger than we. The mind. Uh, 
Now, these guys have not fought the enemy. This is just the mind. Just, just the mind. They had already judged themselves to be the weaker side. And they brought up an evil report of the land which they had searched into the children of Israel, saying, The land through which we have gone to search it is a land that eateth up the inhabitants there. You see, the mind, the mind. Did they see the land opening and say, okay, well, it's eating this one now? They brought another dimension. All of these were indicative indications of the fact that whereas there were walls, strongholds, now you can see exaggeration. It's a tower. It eateth up the inhabitants thereof, and all the people we saw in it were men of great stature. Yeah, next verse. And there we saw the sons of Anak, which come of the giants, and we were in our sight as grasshoppers. You know, this is not, this is exaggerated. This is a tower. Well, as grasshoppers in their sight, and so we were in their sight. Now, so if you are going to deliver people, so Moses had done the hard task of delivering these guys out of Egypt, but Egypt was stealing them. Egypt will not leave them. Moses delivered them one night, and they were out of the place. But in order for them to enter into the inheritance, you could see resistances in terms of walls. You could see resistances in terms of towers, exaggerations, and all kinds of stuff so that they cannot become exactly what God has ordained them to be. So the million-dollar question is how I was supposed to now show you labor the strongholds, which I said we have skipped because the congregation was not um, in this place. How do we pull down strongholds? First of all, still talking about strongholds, you know, we mentioned that strongholds were walls. And the reality of those walls are equal to lies. So walls, strongholds equal what? Walls. And those walls equal what? Lies. So the edifice and the infrastructure, the security that Satan builds around his activities are a heap of lies. A heap of lies. So you could tell the other guys that went with Joshua and Caleb to spy the land, there were many things that they came up with which were lies. They say, the land swallows is inhabited. And they believed it. Lie. So if you are going to confront strongholds, you are going to beam into the situation, the truth of God. Listen to me. I need to tell you what a lie is. Hmm? As far as your thoughts are concerned, anything that is not in line with the word of God is a lie. And Satan is going to build with it. It can be the reality of your circumstances. Your circumstances are different from your destiny. Are you with me? It is only what God has said that is true. So if you are going to confront a stronghold, you will begin by seeking out the truth. So if you see a Christian that is lazy, he doesn't want to study the Bible, doesn't want to know the mind of God, such a Christian cannot get by the way God wants him to get by. He's going to be defective. There's going to be a barricade that he or she cannot explain that constitutes his resistance. And that barricade is in form of stronghold. Now, if you come to a city like uh, London, you come to a city like London, and you see how it is the systems work, the transport systems are effective, the Uber system is effective, the taxi system is effective. Uh, people are just moving around. Everything is working. There's, the electricity is in place. Restaurants are everywhere. Every, it, it, when you, you come to a city like that, Right, and you are fully persuaded that God has spoken to you that you are an apostle that is sent to such a city. Hmm? 
in order for you to penetrate that city, you need to be in a good frame of mind. And you must have been inoculated with a lot of truth such that the existing resistances that stare you in the face, you call them. You know, some time ago, I began to teach you about a sent mentality. The thing that Jesus did to his disciples, that they were able to carry a global vision. They left his training places with a sent mentality. That's the kind of mentality that agents of darkness have when they send them from their pavilion to come and wreak havoc among humanity. They come with a sent mentality. If a witch is sent to you, brother, he will gain employment, that which will gain employment where you are working, for proximity's sake, in order for the possibility of carrying out the assignment of an expression. When, when, when that witch moves with a sent mentality, the things you might call obstacles will become stepping stones. That's the same kind of thing that happens to a man that is infused with truth. He can no longer see obstacles. You can't see. You need to walk on the streets of Johannesburg. And after walking on the streets of Johannesburg, ask yourself, how do we start ministry in this town? It's like a prison. Oh, but when we got there, we didn't see that prison. We held a meeting, a, a meeting for three days. And after three days, our branch in South Africa has started till today. Three days. Three days was enough. And we have a thriving branch in South Africa. No, to, to the glory of God, not because I'm, I'm so smart, no. But you see, you see if, you, if you are not operating by the walls, you will gain knowledge. When people come to me to explain the, their challenges, I just say, Jesus Christ. This one is bound. And I've seen people with broad chests that gym that are bound. I've seen people, do you understand? Very beautiful damsels that got bound. Bound. One came, he, he traced his grandfather. He said this was a weakness. He traced the father, he said this is a weakness. He traced his, his, see, see, bound. Satan has taught him a doctrine. And he used genealogy to teach it. A tower. If we take out those towers and take out those walls, you will see that possibility is the only option that exists. If God has spoken, it will come to pass. It doesn't matter what the economy... You see, if we remove the walls, remove the towers, you will discover that faith is easy. Faith, believing God is easy. Standing with God is easy. Aligning with God is easy. Doing exploits is easy. But what the challenge is, it's not even the demons that operate around. It's the strongholds that are built in the minds of men. So the first thing that you need to do against the system of strongholds is that you must find the truth. The only thing that can expose those lies are the truth that are hidden in the word of God. Do you labor in the truth? Do you study your Bible? Do you hear what God says you are? Do you understand the implication of being a new creation? That is the truth. And you must adopt that as your reality. And anything that is contrary to the truth is a lie. No matter how much evidences those things bring, there are lies. When Satan sees that you have locked your heart to even visible evidence and you are inclined to believe in God, he knows he has lost the battle. For instance, the pastor that was speaking um, in the voice note, all right, so the thing came, that's when we started speaking. And I said, no, this, this is how Satan operates, this is how Satan operates, this is what you need to do, and you keep doing it. And the guy got that victory even before we met physically. I know Satan hates me with passion because many of his captives have been set free cheaply. Oh, and they, oh, are you there? Are you there? Are you there? 
Now, see, the, the, the reason why we are doing this is because you've been around this mountain for too long. It is time for you to step out. It's time for you to move on in the name of Jesus. So the first thing you need to do is to shine the light. Shine the light. I remember I was studying, you know, I was born very sickly and all of that. And then I was studying the book of Isaiah chapter 53. When the Bible says that, uh, who has believed our report and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed. For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of dry ground. And there is no form nor comeliness. And when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. Right? The Bible called him a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. And we heed as it were our faces. Surely, he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken. Smitten of God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgression. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes. Gaboga. That was where the bullet. The the bullet shot my heart. With his stripes. We are. And as I read that scripture. Something happened. In, in about two, three seconds, and I was able to see in the spirit, and the reality of my healing touched my heart. That became truth. The moment that happened, the healing did not take place instantly, but nothing could wrestle away that truth that I had seen from my heart. Faith was born, and in one week, I was better. In two weeks, I was even much more better. Three weeks, I was much, much, much better. Four weeks, I was bubbling. And that's how I walked out of sickness till this day. So what we are saying here is that truth is a reality. Truth is a testimony of a personality. Truth is the living word of God. And when you have an encounter with truth, any other thing that produces evidences are lies. And the same way Satan built the walls by putting block after block, you are going to dismantle the walls block after block after block. Sometimes thoughts will flood your mind, then you rebel against it and you speak to it. And then another block goes. And then another block goes. And then seven blocks go. 14 blocks go. 21 blocks go. And it will become a dwarf fence. By the time it's a dwarf fence, it can't even stop you again. So Satan will... Because he's short of my arterias, will come and remove the other blocks by himself and go and build somewhere else. <laughs> oh my God. Oh my God. Hallelujah. And guess what? The moment the walls are gone and you see through the vista of truth, the exaggerated towers will crumble by themselves. The microscope that you were using to magnify it will fall off your eyes, the scales will fall off, and suddenly you will see the treachery, you will see the exaggeration, and then you will see that there are microscopic organisms that can be ignored. And the moment you have seen that, the captivity that you were in, in the prison house, you come out of the prison of your own accord. So you get the gist now. It begins with what? Truth. And then Satan sometimes can be forceful, the way the uh, pastor described his experience, be imposing the thoughts, using demonic spirits. And then when you are imposed upon like that, you speak back. Tell him, no, you are wrong. I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. The best, you are mistaken. You were not in court. Because in court, I was justified. And God, who is the judge of all, declared me discharged and acquitted. It's just that you didn't come to court, so you are still operating from an old perspective. The current situation is that I was discharged and acquitted. Sometimes you need to preach to Satan. I say, oh, you, you know, it's obvious you were not in court, and he doesn't like preaching. I preach to him many times. He will show up. Somebody did me so much wrong, and I was bitter. And the Holy Spirit whispered to me, 
the way to escape this bitterness now, he begin to say, I love that person. Mention his name. I love him. I love him. I love him. I love him. Then my heart began to, to love him. And then Satan left. Satan left. He said, no, we can't plant this seed of bitterness here because it will not grow. The guy is into, is into weeding, consistent weeding. Those your brothers that you hate, I say, if I see them, if I see them, I go do something. I go, you see, wake up from this meeting, go, keep saying it for 14 days. I love Jane. I love Jane. I love Jane. You see, you are speaking from truth. Because the Holy Ghost that is inside of you, the Bible says it's him that sheds abroad our hearts love. So keep saying it. I love you. Very soon, the root of bitterness will be strong. It will dry up. It will wither. And the exaggerated tower will fall of its own accord. Just like the twin towers of 9-11. It will drop down. And then you begin to think in a sober way. You begin to think in your right mind. It, it will be possible for you to begin to think the thoughts of God. Every bondage that you have carried for 12 years, for 15 years, for 35 years, that bondage that has kept you on the same spot, you are walking free tonight in the name of Jesus Christ.